It's one minute past top of the hour. I am uh, Mauricio Towen, and it is my pleasure to introduce today's speaker. And I will start with uh, what's the most important thing for us, which is that uh, Dr. Bolton is a professor in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences here at UNM. And he adds a value in different ways, including on the clinical side. He is the medical director of the faculty clinic. And he also has a, num a number of roles within UNM and the Health Science Center. He is the director of the HSC Institute of Ethics and also chair of the UNM Hospital Ethics Committee. He's also the director of the Health Science Center Office of Professionalism, and he is an Associate Vice Chancellor, Chancellor for Academic Affairs. Dr. Bolton joined um, UNM 15 years ago, and before that, he was at uh, Harvard Med Medical School, Cambridge Health Alliance, and Brown. Uh, and I had the opportunity to meet uh, Dr. Bolton back in the in the Northeast. So uh, I've known uh, uh, Dr. Bolton for more than a decade. Uh, he's got a very uh, uh, interesting and uh, wonderful uh, background, which is he started his training in anthropology. I've, I've shared with, uh, with Dr. Bolton that at some point, that's what I was thinking of doing, but I didn't. So Dr. Bolton did get his degree at, in anthropology uh, at Michigan State and at Cambridge uh, University. And actually he has taught medical anthropology uh, both at Brown at, and at, uh, here at UNM. So um, it is uh, my honor to introduce him today. And his topic is going to be introduction to the ethics committee and the ethics consultation service. Dr. Bolton. Well, Dr. Turn, thank you so much uh, for that introduction, and it's a um, it's really an honor to be um, uh, a member of the of a department that has had so many um, amazing um, ethicists, from Dr. Um, Laura Roberts to Cindy Gapper to Dr. Bailey. Um, among others. So it's really a fantastic place to be and to work. Um, and this, this talk is actually the second in, um, uh, in a series uh, of medical ethics talks. Kendall Rogers, the division chief of hospital medicine, uh, gave a talk on the values that were so important to the creation of the UNM hospital. And next week, uh, Dr. Asinegas will present on cognition and decisional capacity um, from a neuropsychiatric perspective for clinicians and for researchers. So, um, so today, though, uh, I'm going to talk about how ethics is done in our institution and in healthcare more broadly. Um, and I have a number of really grandiose uh, objectives, and I can't tell if my slides are actually being are they up or you can Brief see comment dr bolton uh if you can just show the main slide because we can see them all okay the right side lower side uh, like this perfect beautiful thank you uh, the trouble is that just wiped out my notes <laughs> oh um well maybe we don't need the slides so let me just go old school on you. So um, I have a number of grandiose uh, objectives, um, uh, and they're grandiose for lots of reasons, but the other is that there's never been any real behavior change with a single exposure, and this is a single exposure. But here are my grandiose um, objectives. One, you'll uh, think about your work differently, and you'll be able to distinguish a technical problem from an ethical problem you are going to participate in all the HSC ethics activities. Um, you're gonna join the ethics committee uh, and you're gonna refer cases to the ethics consultation service and you're even gonna become an ethics consultant. So that's 
those are my objectives. We'll see how successful I am. But um, um, this talk is not about ethics in the sense of uh, thinking about ethics or current ethical issues like physician assisted suicide or the use of chemical restraints or even therapy and animals. Although all of those are really interesting to talk about. Um, this is going to be on how ethics has become part of the everyday practice of medicine and how people who do it, um, do this work actually go about it. Um, it also highlights the non-technical aspects of medical practice. So actually in much of our work, the technical aspects are the easier parts. Trying to figure out what the right thing to do is actually quite difficult often. Um, and I'm gonna put in, or Lillian is going to put in an article that I found very useful as a resident. It's written by John Sadler, who's a psychiatrist and a philosopher at UT Southwestern. Uh, and I think he has a very nice model for thinking about these non-technical dimensions to our practice. So I'd like to start off with a case. Um, uh, and the, it was a case that came to the attention of the ethics consultation services. It was actually my first case. And by now I realized it was sort of fairly ordinary uh, because I've seen a lot of cases very similar to it since then, but at the time it was sort of eye-opening um, and uh, confusing, to be honest. Um, uh, so I'm gonna try and explain why I found this an interesting case, even if it was messy, and even if it was ultimately unsuccessful as a consultation, but here are the facts. Uh, the patient was an 86-year-old man who had had a stroke that resulted in terrible, devastating cognitive and motor deficits. Um, he had been stabilized at a previous hospitalization and discharged to a, a nursing facility. But while he was there, he extubated himself at least three times. And once it resulted in uh, acute respiratory failure and hypoxemia, and this is actually why he was re-hospitalized at uh, UNMH. And this happened about six weeks before the consultation. By the time we saw him, he was medically stabilized. Um, he was not likely to get much more benefit from being in the hospital. And the team had recommended that he be discharged to a lower intensity institution. There weren't a lot of options. He could go home, he could go to another facility, or he could stay in the hospital. Um, obviously the patient wasn't able to, um, to make this decision and his wife had taken on the responsibility for, uh, for making decisions. And ethics was consulted to try to help with the conflict that had arisen between the, the wife and the treating team over discharge planning and the team had got to the point where they, they wondered if the wife was actually sabotaging efforts to discharge him. Some facilities had denied him on the basis of rules like his oxygen flow rate was too high or that he still required soft restraints uh, to prevent him from extubating himself and that was disallowed. Um, some potential options were closed down by the wife um, uh, for example, she didn't want him transferred to an out-of-state facility. The VA would accept him, but only as a hospice patient, and they would only provide supportive care. And the wife refused to consider hospice because she believed that he would recover. Um, and she said that she believed that he would regain functioning and would be able to live again independently. And when I asked her about this, she said, well, obviously it's gonna require a miracle, but she, required, she believed in miracles and she expected the hospital to wait until that miracle happened. Um, and in the meantime, she wanted the hospital to do everything to maximize his rehabilitation and his uh, care. Um, she didn't want him to go home because she really couldn't manage his really immense medical needs. There were also some other facts that were important uh, that came out as we, as we worked with her. First is 
She came to New Mexico fairly recently from a, another state and she didn't have any friends in the area, didn't have any family. She also had um, a number of dogs that she loved and were crucially supportive to her. And she didn't want them to be affected or to have to put them in some sort of um, placement if she had to move out of state for uh, the care to be with her husband where he was gonna potentially get care. They didn't have a lot of money. They couldn't, she couldn't pay for the rent or food or other things if she had to go out of state. Um, she had not actually been able to pay and there was no reason to think she could pay for the services that she had already, that her husband had already received. And certainly she couldn't pay for extra support at home. So for her, it was clear that the hospital was by far the best option. Um, however, for the medical team, they believed that his care was no longer received hospital level services and he could be discharged to a more lower or more appropriate level of care. So, so why, how did, why was this interesting? Why was this case interesting to me? And the first thing that struck me was um, it was a real conflict. It was a real conflict between the medical team, the hospital and the patient or the surrogate over a decision. So it wasn't this happy alignment of patient needs and medical care that we like, that we like to have. In this situation, each party had their own self-interests and they'd taken their own position and neither was really gonna back down. Um, and so they really didn't look like there was gonna be a mutually agreeable solution. The second thing that I found really interesting, um, and maybe it's because I came from anthropology, was her interest in miracles. Um, it really surprised me. And, um, and I thought, wow, if you're really truthful about this, if this really is a core belief, then it means that your worldview is so different to my worldview and to the worldview of um, probably her clinician, the clinicians that were taking care of her husband. She allowed the possibility of supernatural intervention. So how could there be communication across this significant gap? Um, uh, there were, the worldviews that were involved were so different. I actually had my doubts about her belief. Um, you know, should we or should the treatment team or the hospital accept this implicit appeal to religious freedom? Should we take it at face value? Or was it a rhetorical device to, to persuade the hospital? Were there real in, were there sort of real reasons behind this presentation that were really based in self-interest? And so this, I think, is it's something that we come across in therapy all the time. You know, what is the what are good reasons that people present for doing something or and what is the real reason? And so trying to figure that out is a big part of the problem. The third thing that struck me about this case, and it's now so ordinary that I'm surprised I was surprised at the time, but it was my first exposure to this thicket of these inclusion and exclusion criteria um, that hospitals or facilities have. You know, why is it that, that one facility had a rule about maximal oxygen flow or another one had a rule about soft restraints? Um, this is the landscape that our patients and our family members and clinicians have to navigate. And I, you know, I wondered about why, why is it that we have this healthcare system? You know, it's based on a free market, fair enough, but it also allows um, these sorts of decisions to be based on business decisions rather than clinical decisions. So it's an, it's an immensely complicated system that we and our patients have to face. Um, uh, and they're not, we don't have, they don't have to face them with sort of ethical arguments. It's, it's other, um, they have to use other approaches. So we, you know, we presented a number of different recommendations in sort of a stratified list of, you know, first best and worst options um, to follow. But to cut a long story short, 
Um, none of them really took root. Um, the stalemate continued and ultimately the conflict ended when the patient died in hospital. So, you know, we could take the whole hour actually unpacking this ordinary case for what it contains, but instead really what I wanna do is um, present an overview of, of bioethics um, and to describe how it has become professionalized, institutionalized in our healthcare system and how it is that clinical ethicists try to resolve conflicts like this one. Um, before I do that, I need to sort of make a confession. Um, I've first, I've always believed that it's uh, the training in other disciplines makes medical practice way more interesting. You know, for me, it was anthropology. It introduced me to, you know, or sensitized me to the cultural or the social uh, influences on the organization and the practice of medicine. But people I know have trained in law or history have had the same experience. That said, um, I must con confess that until fairly recently, um, I was intimidated by ethicists and I didn't really have a lot of interest in studying it. I thought that ethicists were simply smarter than me. They were very seriously minded and sometimes they came across as a little preachy. Um, so I was, I kept it at arm's length. Um, however, times change and nothing increases one's interest in a field more than getting a job in it. Um, so about two years ago, I had the great luck to become the director of the HSC Institute of Ethics and the chair of the Ethics Committee. And so since then, I've really tried to learn a lot about the field, and I'm going to present my read on it today. So, so having had this conversion on the road to Damascus, I'm here to tell you how much fun and how interesting and how unscary ethics, ethics really is. So, so here's my best effort to describe the thinking that's involved in an ethics consultation. Um, it's one way into the domain of ethics, um, or at least one subdomain of ethics, and that's the domain of normative ethics. Normative ethics really addresses the question of what should you do in a situation, um, you know, should you do something because it's based on a rule or that sort of thing? We'll talk about that in a sec. That subdomain is different to empirical ethics, which investigates why people say what they, you know, what people say they believe. And Dr. Roberts' um, really important research was really in empirical ethics. The other branch of ethics that we're not going to talk about is called meta ethics, which talks about the basic concepts that we use. So um, Brent Kios, who is a, a really an amazing psychiatrist and philosopher, just published an article on the meanings of the word suffering and how do we use this and what are the implications of the different meanings. So that would be a form of meta-ethics. We're going to stay with normative ethics to try to understand how we think about what should be done in a case. Um, it would be great if we talked about other things like, you know, the many of the important concepts that we're facing or issues that we're facing as, as um, psychiatrists today, but we're going to stay on um, uh, very close to the ground uh, and try to understand how ethical decisions are made, both by practitioners, but also by um, clinical ethicists. So the everything starts with a situation. So a, a situation arises um, and it calls for an action. Um, a situation might be a new symptom or a new diagnosis or for this gentleman that I described, it was the end of a phase of treatment. So the situation arises and it calls for somebody to act. Um, uh, so in a sense, the situation demands a response. Now, some situations are really urgent and high stakes, like the case I presented, but most are not. So most of the decisions or the situations that we um, have to reckon with are fairly ordinary. You know, by the time you've worked in 
PES as a resident for two months, a lot of those situations have become fairly routinized. Um, so, you know, a trivial, trivial example of a, of a situation that arose is this Grand Rounds. So it, it, it's a thing um, and it creates in the people who get the mailing, the decision, do I show up or not? Um, uh, it's a fairly low stakes decision, you know, um, it's even lower by the fact that we could be doing, and not me, but you could be doing anything you want and show up. Um, so, um, so that's, you know, we, that's a trivial example of a situation that causes a decision that we have to make. Um, but the decisions that really stump us are the, the rare, the extraordinary, the high stakes, the urgent um, decisions um, that, um, that confront us, that arise. Um, the situations and the decisions that must be made because they arise are not, they're sometimes a private events. They're sometimes things that only we know but um, often the action that we're thinking about is going to have an effect on other people. And so when this is the case, other people weigh in and change the decision. So, so we're starting off with the situation. The situation creates the need to do something. The, the second element in this is the decider. Somebody has to make the decision um, about the action that's going to happen. Uh, the person has to choose amongst the various options. So this is the designated decision maker. And in some cultures, the, des the designated decision maker may not be the person who actually has the affliction uh, or the person who is going to be most directly affected by the decision. In some cultures, it might be a matriarch or a chief or a family member or some other uh, the term that an anthropologist called is treatment decision unit. Um, sometimes the decision actually isn't even made by a human. It's made by consulting an oracle. You know, the, somebody goes to the oracle and asks, what should I do? And the oracle tells them. However, in our culture, the designated decision makers for medical decisions are ordinarily the individual who has the illness and who will be most affected by the outcome of the choice. And so this is established in law. It is part of our ordinary practice. We take it for granted. Um, that said, everyone, you know, in some situations, it isn't that person, it's somebody else. So if you, if for a minor, the parent is the designated decision maker or for people like the patient I presented, it would be the proxy decision maker or a surrogate decision maker or a judge even. So deciders or decision makers vary hugely in how they make decisions, how good they are at making decisions. Um, they vary in how well they understand the options or the downstream consequences. Um, they vary in what the situation means to them, um, where they are in life. You know, if you're 90 and you're, you've just been given a terrible terminal diagnosis, the decisions that you make may be quite different to the person who is 22 and has the same diagnosis. Um, people, decision makers vary hugely in their value system, their belief system, their worldview or cosmology. They vary hugely in the capital that they have available to make decisions and so on. So the point is, there is no single perfect or ideal or model decision maker. Our patients um, in our practice are often compromised uh, in their decision making by a mood state. You know, the, the decisions that somebody makes when they're manic will be really quite different to the decisions that they make when they're depressed or euthymic. Uh, thought disorders interfere with decision making, personality disorders, you know, people who are compulsive or, um, uh, or obsessional rather. Uh, often have a terrible time making decisions and they'll make them impulsively, head injuries, those sorts of things. So this, the second thing we have to sort of have some sense of is who is this decision maker and how, how good are they? Or, you know, what, what, are, what 
you know, what is going on for them. The third variable is options. So, you know, the, the situation arises and um, it forces the decision, um, but there are gonna be options available. Um, if there's no option, there's no ethical decision. You know, there is no decision because there's no option. Um, so, but the decision maker, you know, even a slave or a, um, a person in solitary confinement has some options available, even if it's to kill himself. Um, so there is really no situation where there's no option. Um, but options vary. Sometimes they're high cost. Sometimes they, um, they're not readily accessible. They have certain advantages or disadvantages. Um, one of the consequences of our fantastic success in medical science is the explosion of options that we have available to us that our grandparents didn't have. It's got to the point where we expect that there must be a new option available uh, for some terrible situation, or at least there will be in the future. Um, uh, so, you know, some of the ethical issues that we discuss now that weren't discussable in the 1940s are discussable, they are issues because we now have the option of life sustaining treatment like ECMO and that sort of thing. Some options are exclusive. You can only do one or the other uh, and you can't uh, sort of do the other one later. Um, uh, so, so the point is that for a situation where the person is trying to figure out what the right thing to do is, there's a range of options that they will um, have uh, to choose from. So uh, the person now has to decide. Um, the situations create two questions. The first question is, what can I do? What's possible to do? And that's a factual question. That's a factual situation. If, ec if ECMO exists, then you might be able to use it. If ECMO does not is not in existence, it's not an option. So, so the first question is, what can I do? Um, the second question for us today is more important or more relevant, that is, what should I do? And the stack question is not a question of fact. It's not true or false. It's a question of value. And so now we are getting into the domain of ethics. What should I do is um, the question isn't what I can do, it's really what should I do? And then the person now has to decide, okay, how am I gonna decide what I should do? Why should I do this and not that? There are three modes of decision-making about what one should do and why. The first mode is, it's called moral commitment. A person may choose to act in a way that is congruent with a moral attitude or commitments that the person has made. So they might be consciously made or they might be vaguely held about, you know, this is what a, a good person does or this is the right thing to do. Um, but the person who's making a choice based on a moral commitment is trying to do the right thing as they see it. And there are three, sorry, I don't know why I keep doing threes, but maybe it's just easier for me to think in threes. There are three general reasons why somebody will do the right thing. They will do the right thing because they feel an obligation to do it. And you might have an obligation because of uh, a duty, or you may have an obligation because you promised, or you may have an obligation because um, you hold a commitment to do whatever has the best effect for the most people, those sorts of things. So the, the first reason why people will choose to do the right thing is because they have an obligation to do it. The second reason is that uh, there's a value at stake. I, let's say I'm a physician. Um, I value, I place high value on, com on compassion. 
if I'm trying to choose between doing two things, if I have an option of doing something that is more compassionate and another thing is less compassionate, I will probably choose the more compassionate option simply because that's a value that I hold. And then the last reason that we might do the right thing is because it's con congruent with a virtue. I want to be a good doctor. Good doctors do this and don't do that. So, so that's why I'll do this. So, so the first reason, the first mode that people may use to choose what they should do or what they want, what, what they think is the right thing to do is moral commitment. The second reason is self-interest. Um, the person chooses to do the thing that effectively advances his or my interest, for example. I'm doing what's best for me. So I don't want to speak for other people who work, who do moonlighting in the PS, but it's a primarily a self-interest. You know, I really um, think it's a good thing to do. I like the work, but the majority of my decision is based on self-interest. Um, sometimes this is called e um, egoism or sometimes it's called prudential reasoning. It's not necessarily bad. It's just the reason that you're doing what you're doing. The third thing, the third mode for deciding to do the right thing is coercion. So um, sometimes uh, a decision to be made or the options that are available uh, is forced on the person. So somebody else has enough power to force me to decide whether to do something that ordinarily I wouldn't consider, I wouldn't do it. Um, and some situations or workplaces are more coercive than others or contain more coercive pressure. So consider, compare the situation of being a prisoner to the situation of being a physician. There's far more effect of coercion on choice in prison than there is for us. We're more likely to be um, motivated by moral commitment. I should say that coercion is rarely sufficient to determine whether a person is going to do something. Uh, it might increase the likelihood, but the person can still choose to do otherwise. They just have to deal with the consequences. So Socrates, as everybody knows, was coerced into killing himself by the city state. But how and why he chose to kill himself were consistent with his moral commitments. So the coercion didn't determine for him why he did it. It set it up, but he decided to kill himself for reasons that Plato describes. So to summarize, these three modes, we could talk about them as should, want, as I want something, or must, as in I must do something. And each situation that we deal with is unique and contains a different mix of these modes or influences. Um, some decisions are mostly made because people pressure us. Some decisions are mostly made by, because we think it's the right thing to do, and some based on self-interest. So, so I'm gonna give you just a brief example. Um, let's take this situation where you've said something or you've done something wrong you've made a mistake, you committed an error, or you've humiliated somebody or something like that. The decision that you have to make is, should I apologize? Um, so one person might be mostly convinced to apologize because he thinks it's the right thing to do. It's consistent with a moral principle, you know, like do unto others as you would do unto them, or they might believe that apologizing if it was generally practiced would have the best effect on relationships between doctors and patients, or a person might agree, might believe that this is what good doctors do, or nurses, or social workers. The second person might decide to apologize because it will reduce the likelihood that they'll get into trouble, that they'll be sued, or they'll be trashed on a rate your doctor website. Um, so they're making the decision based out of self-interest. The third person might decide to apologize because the health system, like University of Michigan health system, has mandated, has a policy that if you are involved in a error, 
that you are required to apologize. So this person might primarily apologize because they are coerced into doing it. So what's the point, what's the relevance of this? Um, the immediate practical relevance for the ethics consultant in any way is that it highlights that for any particular person, there are gonna be different influences on the decision maker. And that we have to try to get access. We have to try to understand what is driving or what the modes are for that person to make the choice that they do. We can then use that information later to figure out, is it modifiable? Can we try to help them and so on? But so we've been talking about moral deliberation, why a person would decide to do something. And, you know, it'd be based on one of those three uh, modes. Um, the person who's making the decision isn't the only person involved in it. So other people will have an opinion about the decision that the person is making. So these could be family members or doctors or nurses or the person's reference group. So I was just in a case recently where the LDS elder was in the room helping the person to make the decision. So it may be that these other people are directly affected by the decision that the person, the designated decision maker, by their decision. Or it may be that the decision that the person is making is at odds with, the, uh, with what the other person is trying to accomplish or wants to do. Or it may be that it, it's incongruent with the beliefs or values of the other person. Um, so there will be reactions of the others or by the others um, to the person who is making the decision. Um, and sometimes the other people have resources available to try to influence the person and to get them to change their mind, to change their decision. Sometimes they might be able to invalidate the decision by getting their grandma declared incompetent. Um, but sometimes the other person doesn't have sufficient standing to override the person's decision, but they might have enough standing or enough influence to get them to, to, to agree to discuss their decision and they might be open enough to modify it. So this though is the germ of the conflict that we in our work as clinicians and clinician uh, and the um, consultants have to deal with. So when there is conflict between the decision maker and others, um, sometimes it gets stuck, no decision can be made. Um, and if there is no ability to reach a resolution, it'll be like the case I presented where it becomes a stalemate. So how do you, how, what options are there? Um, in the, the bad old days, physicians assumed the authority to simply decide, you know, the right choice is what the doctor decides, the doctor knows best, but that has gone away. Um, physicians don't have that authority anymore, um, if they ever did. Um, and um, so we have to have other, other ways of resolving these conflicts. The ultimate authority, of course, is the legal system uh, in the form of a judge's decision or a jury decision. But that system is so complex and it's simply unable to deal with all of the, you know, the myriad disputes that arise in everyday healthcare settings. It's too slow, it's too burdensome. So as a result, a number of alternative dispute resolution programs have uh, have been developed. And the two that are most relevant to us are the Ethics Committee and the Ethics Consultation Service. So that's what we're gonna end up talking about. But before we do that, I, I wanna just set the scene as to, or set the sort of context as how could these two uh, services or institutions have arisen? You know, why, why do we have them? And they really are a function or a manifestation of the bioethics revolution. Um, this field 
uh, it's really a field because it's not a discipline in the sense that sort of philosophy is a discipline or you know sociology is a discipline. It's really a field that invites philosophers and lawyers and social scientists and others to apply them themselves and their their um, their sort of knowledge base to uh, in, uh, issues that arise in healthcare. So it's a very broad tent. There are a number of subfields of bioethics. There's clinical ethics, um, which is really the primary domain of the ethics consultation service. This deals with issues that arise in interactions between patients and clinicians. There's professional ethics, what it means to be a professional. There's organizational ethics, you know, what is the proper relationship between employer and employee. There's research ethics, um, you know, what's how should we or shouldn't we do uh, research? Public health ethics has been huge in COVID. You know, that's uh, ethics at the community or the population level. And then there's one last uh, grew, or one last discipline, humanities, um, medical humanities, that the, the host professional organization of, of ethics is, is actually called the American Society for Bioethics and Humanities. So that so bioethics really is a very broad tent. It allows pretty much anybody in. It does a lot of things. Um, it came of age in the 1960s, 1970s, and it really coincided and resonated with a push by various groups for greater recognition and protection through the creation of civil rights and other statutes. Um, it's all. It was also propelled by the same. Um, questioning of authority that was going on at the time in other parts of Western societies. Um, in its early stages, bioethics was a really exciting place where scholars from a wide range of disciplines and activists combined their energies and had real effects. And some members of UNM like Rob Schwartz and David Benaham really played important roles in this early, early phase of bioethics. But over time, as happens, um, uh, bioethics became professionalized. Uh, we now have myriad master's level programs, PhD programs in bioethics, postdoctoral fellowships, certificates, and so on. The um, American Society for Bioethics and Human Humanities is promoting a new credential, the Healthcare Ethics Consultation Certification. All of this is right out of the playbook for every other profession, every other occupation that has tried to become established as a profession had a very similar sort of strategy. First, you develop a body of esoteric knowledge, you develop practices, you um, assert and manage cognitive and behavioral norms, you define what is good practice, what is bad practice. So part of bioethics, Part of this sort of cognitive normativity has been the the elaboration of these principles that we all learned you know the four principles of <laughs> watch me forget them uh, respect for autonomy uh, beneficence non-maleficence and justice so that has established has become established as um, as part of the professionalization of bioethics Bioethics has also become institutionalized. Um, it's become integrated into our healthcare organizations. Um, and part of this is a, res a result of the pressure that um, uh, the courts or the government crediting agencies have applied to healthcare organizations to address outcomes, safety, quality. It's no longer a matter of the doctor or the nurse or the pharmacist or the social worker doing the right thing, it's now the healthcare organization that is uh, responsible. So some organizations have really institutionalized bioethics much more than others. So the VA system, for example, has really been energetic in institutionalizing bioethics. And Dr. Gephardt from our department has been very active in this effort. Um, and two forms of this institutionalization um, have been the ethics committee 
and the Ethics Consultation Service. And it has contributed or uh, to the emergence of a new profession, the new profession of the clinical ethicist. You can get a job now as a clinical ethicist. Um, so first, I just want to talk about the clinical, uh, sorry, the ethics committees. Um, these are a manifestation of these, of the need for extra legal alternative uh, dispute resolution. Um, one commentator placed the origin of ethics committees to the God Squad, which was a committee formed by the Seattle Artificial Kidney Center uh, in the 1960s to decide how dialysis, which was a limited resource, was going to be allocated. And they famously came up with a criterion of social worth. If you were a good church going folk, you got a higher score than somebody who didn't go to church, for example. Uh, the next, another really important um, moment was the Karen Ann Quinlan case in 1976. There, the Supreme Court um, created a role for ethics committees that it's really hasn't been able to live up to. It, it was a prognosis role. And it said that uh, the ethics committee should um, uh, concur that a patient will never return to a cognitive sapient state before life support system can be withdrawn. Um, about eight years later, a presidential commission elaborated a number of expectations for ethics commissions um, that the ethics committee will um, review treatment decisions made on behalf of in, incompetent terminally ill patients, that it will provide counseling for patients and family members, um, that it'll establish guidelines. It's, that presidential commission had a very sort of elaborated view of what um, uh, um, ethics committees could do. Similarly, in 1992, the Joint Commission mandated that every healthcare organization have in place a mechanism for making ethical decisions. They didn't specify ethics committees, but they, they mandated that some, some, organ, some mechanism had to be in place. So this was the real push. In the sort of 70s, 80s, there were very few ethics committees um, in uh, healthcare organizations now, it's about 100%. Um, it is not likely that that rapid expansion was due to the real value of, that the ethics committee had in helping clinicians. It was probably more by fiat. Um, uh, but regardless, ethics committees became established. We have two in our system. We have an ethics committee at UNMH and at the SRMC. Um, uh, in our um, UNMH Ethics Committee, we have a very diverse group, nurses, doctors, lawyers, theologians, um, social workers, psychologists, people from the community, people who are retired, practitioners, trainees. We meet once a month. You're entirely welcome to join. Um, it's a fantastic way to learn about how to be an ethicist. The second uh, group uh, that got involved in um, making decisions um, and was sort of slow to start, but really has become the main uh, entity is the Ethics Consultation Service. Um, the, uh, between 2000 and 2018, um, there's been a rapid increase in the number of ethics uh, consultations that have been sought, especially in hospitals like ours with over uh, 400 beds. Um, increasingly, those consultations are being done not by the ethics committee, but by either individual consultants or small teams. Um, about 40% of the consultants really learned how to do it on the job. Um, they uh, um, didn't have any real training, about 40% uh, have had training um, in how to do it, and, uh, and about 8% uh, actually completed a graduate program in uh, bioethics. 
We have our, our own ethics consultation service. We have three or four consultants. We're all physicians. We see about two to five cases a month. Uh, we actually had our first MHC consultation this month, thanks to Dr. Uh, Farrar and Dr. Miller. Um, so the training that is required for um, uh, for this is um, you can get it in lots of different ways. We have a we have a program. Um, people can get it through master's programs, those sorts of things. So I'm going to spend the last few minutes on how does an ethics consultant actually assess a case. And we don't have time to go into it in any great detail, um, but the ethics consultant really has to have some expert knowledge and a method that's different from other consultative services. Um, and it starts off with an investigation. The consultant has to figure out what is the actual question, just like every consultant. Um, and, um, and we have to know sort of why it's a problem, a moral problem, not a technical problem. So we, we want to get involved. We want to know who's involved in this, who's arguing for what uh, actual course. We want to gather collateral information from various experts. And then we come up with a, a formulation. And we, um, we want to figure out what actually is the ethical problem here. There will be non-ethical problems that we come up with, that we discover. They might be technical problems, or they might be legal problems. You know, the law has defined certain um, uh, obligations uh, for clinicians or hospitals. The, um, uh, there are various statutes that define what has to be done. These are all sort of informational, non-ethical problems. Uh, you know, our, our hospital will have DNR policies. Um, another problem will be a capacity evaluation. Does this person have the capacity to make a decision. The actual ethical problems that we get involved with or focus on are really three types. The first is where the person really doesn't know what the right thing to do is. There's a degree of uncertainty. Um, the person doesn't know which rule to apply or um, you know, the physician might understand a case in terms of principles, um, but see a conflict between, you know, on the one hand, say, respecting the patient's autonomy, and on the other hand, being beneficent. So really not knowing how to juggle those, um, those principles. So that kind of situation is really dealt with by education or discussion. The second kind of problem is uh, ambivalence, um, might be within the person or between amongst a group. And the individuals want to know what the right thing to do is, but they don't really know what the right choice is. So in this situation, the consultant facilitates the process of discussion. Um, and the last situation is where there's a conflict. Um, there's a conflict between, um, say, the patient and others. It might be a conflict over obligation what do we have to do or what is the healthcare provider obligated to do by law, by policy, by principles. Um, sometimes it's over values. What is the right thing to do? Not what must we do, but what is the right thing to do? And so trying to get a sense of uh, the values at stake. So for example, a Jehovah's Witness might agree with a doctor that they want to live. There's no dispute about the outcome. It's just how to get to that point without using a blood transfusion. So the ethics consultants, um, they get involved and they want to know, uh, you know, where is their ambivalence? Where is the conflict? And then they work with the parties to try to figure out um, how the best decision can be made. Importantly, the consultant does not make the decision. The consultant does not have the authority to make these decisions in general. There are a few instances when uh, that is not the case, but generally we have to use various um, methods to try to figure out what the important values are and what the important 
and what the participants can do to try to come up with a good outcome. So just to summarize, um, the, we started off with a situation. Uh, it forces a decision on a group or a person. The decider has to choose between various options uh, or find other options. Um, and there are three general modes of choosing. Do we base it on moral commitment? Do we base it on self-interest or do, do we base it on coercion? Um, and so really the remainder of the work that we do is trying to figure out how the participants can come to some uh, resolution if they can come to a resolution about what the best way to do that is. So the last thing I'm gonna say is it's a, it's a welcome and it's an invitation. Please consider joining the ethics committee um, if you are interested in doing consultations and learning how to do that, uh, we have ways to make that happen. So I'm going to end here. I only, uh, I apologize, I only left a few minutes to, um, to, to discuss, but that really was an overview of clinical ethics and what we are trying to do in our institution to help patients and clinicians end up with better decisions. Any thoughts, comments? Open for questions, folks. I think Dr. Rome was raising his hand there. Oh, Dr. Roma. I just wanted to give the group a, a plug that the nine month course at the excellent, been learning so much so far, Very, extremely interesting. I did have a question though. Why why is Jayco targeting the ethics committee and doing an investigation on our program? Well, that's it. I didn't know they were. That's interesting. I, <laughs> Thank you. Now I know to be anxious. April Fools, guys. Ah, great. You got me. Thank you, though. That was a good presentation. Dr. Bolton? Yes, I'm sorry, I can't see who is. Dr. Asinegas. Dave Arsenegas. Oh, Dr. Hey, hey, thanks, thanks for a great overview and, and a very engaging talk. Um, uh, you mentioned that the Ethics Committee is currently receiving two to five consultations a month. In, in an institutional culture where these sorts of questions that you're raising are part of the fabric of the work that's done, what would you expect the rate of consultation requests to be? Or in other words, what, what's your goal for the engagement of the ethics consultation service with the rest of the clinical providers? Yeah, I wish I had a number for you. I think that um, uh, we just had our first consultation from psychiatry recently. So what I would like to see is different areas of our um, system sort of try to get um, a sense of what it is that we offer and and why why it's a good thing to do not just for legal protect legally protective reasons uh, but because it helps with decision making so um so i think part of our job is actually to get the word out to to say you know these are ethical issues these are not uh, practical issues or these are not sort of knowledge issues these are issues that uh, you are facing and at the moment presumably you're doing it alone and, and most of the decisions that clinicians have to make they are fully capable of making them um, but there are some that uh, really could benefit from an airing from a dispassionate group so uh, so yeah our goal is really to get the word out and to put ourselves uh, you know at, you know being completely overwhelmed. Um, but I think one of the interesting things is that each area of our system will have very different and very uh, uniquely interesting issues that arise. So OB or surgery or psychiatry, the issues that we each deal with will be fabulously different and rich and interesting. So, um, so bring them on. Psychiatry. We, Maybe the last question, yeah. because it's top of the hour, Dr. Sure. Bolton, a very important question. 
uh, uh, Brenda McKenna is asking, how do you request a consult? Is there an ad hoc? There is a, um, there's an ad hoc and we're also in um, Amion. So you can, the, the easiest way is simply to contact us through Amion and you can reach us that way. So yes, put us to work. That would be great. So thank you, Dr. Bolton, for a very enlightening, uh, great presentation. Thank you so much. Okay, if I could just add the last word, Dr. Asenegas is going to present next uh, a talk next week on um, uh, on, a, on ethics um, and uh, from his deep expertise and deep experience. So please join us, uh, Dr. Asenegas, next week. But thank you. Look forward. Thank you all.